Good morning, Sycamore. We're going to start off this morning's Bible class by asking a question. And that question is, how many of you really liked school when you were going? Uh, there were probably a lot of good aspects about it, maybe some things you didn't like so much. But what are some of the highlights of things you think about when you go to school? Maybe it's, um, is it the cafeteria food? You know, is it those uh, rectangle pizzas that really uh, just get you excited? Uh, maybe it's some of the equipment that's been around for years on the recess, uh, on the playground, you know, like the monkey bars, uh, the swings. For some of you, and I'm sure for some of you, uh, a lot like me, you know, you love school for the learning. You learned the, the idea of just being a student and, and getting all that knowledge every single day you went. I'm sure some of you were uh, just like me in that regard. Do you remember elementary school? In elementary school, you had... Uh, certain tests that were routine. You had what well, we had spelling tests. You know, and every Monday, at least it was for me, you would be given your list of words for the week to learn. And then Friday, you would go to school and you would have a test. The teacher would call out those names and you would write them down on your piece of paper. It was the idea of us learning the English language. Well, there were these other tests that we had as well. They were called vocabulary tests. And maybe you remember these as well. You would be given a list of words at the beginning of the week, some definitions of what these words meant, and then have a test at the end of the week to make sure you knew uh, what these words meant. It got me to thinking recently because, you know, I wonder how many times we struggle with understanding the Bible, how long, uh, how sometimes we may struggle with following along with the sermon, following along with the Bible class, and um, mainly because of the words that are used. You'll find, especially even when you're reading the Bible, uh, there are some books that are very easy to read. There are some that are very practical. There are some that, like right now, if you're reading 2 Kings for Bible Bowl, um, it, it's very story-oriented, and so it tells you about this location and this king and, and what happened. And those are very easy to follow along. And then some of the other books that you may have in the Bible, uh, that may be a, written in a little bit different in a different style, so therefore maybe a little bit harder to read, or you have to pay attention a little bit more, and then makes it more difficult when you don't know exactly what the words mean. So, I was I was thinking I was you know why don't we have vocabulary tests in the church? Why don't we uh, you know even maybe some of our kids' classes we just say you know okay we need to make sure that you understand what exactly these words mean because a lot of times you know some words are used so often. Um, and maybe sometimes even in every Bible class or in every sermon to where you just assume everybody knows exactly what it means and we don't take a moment to pause and to uh, just say, okay, this is actually what this word means in the Bible. And so I thought this morning, why not just keep it simple and why not just go through a Bible class where we're simply going to have vocabulary words. Okay, so I'm going to give you a word. Feel free to pause the video if you want. I won't necessarily pause for a moment and I won't say that for everyone. But pause the video. Maybe you can say out loud if you're with somebody. Say, oh, that word means, you know, whatever you want to say. And then I'll just give you a couple of words of definition. Uh, and then I'll give you a Bible verse that it's actually shown in. And so we'll go through several words. And then uh, when we get to the end, uh, I'll give you a little test to see how much you memorized. Sound good? All right, let's get started. So the first word I thought we would start with is the word forgive. What does it mean to forgive someone? What, well, when you look in a lot of our Bible dictionaries, it's going to tell us that the word forgive means to dismiss or to set free. Think about the song that we sing, um, I'll Fly Away. And it talks about a bird from prison, prison bars have flown. You know, the idea that it is set free. It's the idea of where a guilty person is dealt with is if he were innocent. That's what the word forgive means. Sometimes you have the word forgiven or forgiveness that you'll read as well. These are all associated with kind of the same root word. But forgiveness means a remission of debt of punishment. So let's look at a verse. Take Colossians 2.13 for example. It says, And you, being dead in your trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. It gives you this, this drastic, 
drastic you know, contrast of you were dead in your trespasses. You were dead, but he, meaning God, he's made you alive. And how has he done that? He has forgiven you. He has set free. He has dismissed the charges against you in your sins. Forgive. So you may have seen in that, that uh, definition of forgiveness, it used the word remission. Again, we use the word remission sometimes, and you may say, well, what exactly is remission? What does it mean? Well, here we go. It means to discharge or to overlook. It, it's very closely uh, associated with the word forgive or forgiveness. It's the idea of a dismissal of debt or punishment. Again, your sins are excluded from punishment. So these words are very closely related. That's why you'll read, even in some versions, uh, you will read um, the idea, you'll read the word forgiveness, and in other places you'll read the word remission. But probably the most popular verse you can think about is Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It's Peter is preaching to the people, and this verse right before this says they were, they were cut to the heart. They wanted to know what they should do. And then Peter said, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Some versions may even put the word uh, for forgiveness of sins. So what is the idea? The idea is you repent and you're baptized and then therefore your sins are remitted. Your sins are overlooked or discharged or excluded. They're no longer there. That's the idea of even becoming a Christian. Remission. Speaking of repent, you see that word in the very beginning of this, this verse we just looked at in Acts 2.38 where Peter says repent. Well, what does it actually mean? Because that, that, again, I'm using very common words that we say all the time. Well, repent, it literally means to change your mind or to change your purpose. Uh, it also can mean the idea of a feeling of remorse and a feeling of sorrow. Um, it's not the idea, you know, sometimes we will say, we will use the illustration, it's, it's you know, making a 180 degree turn. Like you're going down one street and then all of a sudden you just turn around and come back the exact opposite. Well, that's somewhat of the idea, but there's a feeling or there's a remorse, there's a reason for that. And, and notice this, the word repent it always carries about the idea of a change in your life and the change always for better when, when the Bible talks about that. You see the word repentance closely related with repent. One of the words that builds off of the word repent. Basically repentance is it's kind of the idea of it's an afterthought. It's been done. All right. Revelation 2 5 for example. You know as John is, is writing a letter to the churches there and he's writing a letter to one of the churches and he says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The idea is they needed to turn back to God. They needed to follow the word of God. And so he's saying, repent, turn. Exact same thing Peter was telling the people in Acts 2. Repent. And how do you repent? Well, you turn to Jesus. You give your life to him. Repent. What about faith? You know, faith is faith is a word we hear nonstop. So let's look at what it means. Faith is a couple of different words. It can mean a very firm persuasion. Faith means confidence. You have confidence in something. But faith, most importantly, is the idea of trust. It's what it means when we say, do you have faith? Do you trust God? It's the idea of a conviction that is based upon hearing and not upon sight. And that, that's a very valid thing and a thing to keep in mind as well. Um, and I talk to our college students all the time about the idea of having faith and not necessarily having evidence. Um, and those are two different things. I mean, if you show me the evidence for things, then certainly I can say, yes, that's true. Uh, I believe it. It is accurate. But the idea of faith is based on this idea of, of believing in something, of trusting in something, even if you can't literally see it in front of you.
we see the word faithful. It builds off the word faith. Faithful means someone who has influence or somebody who's worthy of confidence. The idea that you can believe someone because they are faithful. Now, again, the most popular verse about faith and faithfulness goes to Hebrews chapter 11. Listen to what it says and think about you know, the definition we just talked about, the idea of trusting when we read these. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. And by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Again, it goes back to this idea that you have faith, you trust in something based upon hearing it, not upon sight. You know, he says, he says, verse 3, that the worlds were framed by the word of God. You think back to Genesis chapter 1, where God spoke things into existence. Faith. The next word is hope. Hope is, is closely related to faith. You, you, see, you saw it in that uh, verse we just looked at in Hebrews chapter 11. You hear the idea of hope, and, and this especially is a word that means something very different when you read in the Bible and from a biblical sense, opposed to um, kind of our common everyday language of how sometimes people use the word hope. See, the word hope, when you read in the Bible, and we talk about you and I having hope, that is to expect something. You know, it is a firm, it is a well-grounded expectation. You know, I expect this to happen. It's the idea of an expectation of something in the future. And what do we have hope for? Well, we have hope for eternal life. We have hope for, um, for Jesus returning and, and judging. We have a hope for heaven. You know, these are the ideas of what hope means. Hope is not like we would say today and we'd say, uh, you know, are we going to get there on time? Well, I hope so. It's kind of like, you know, you're just guessing. Well, that that's, we hope to be there, but I'm not sure. Well, that's not the idea of what the Bible means. The Bible means when you say hope, it means to expect it. Look at Romans 5.5. 5. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The very idea that hope doesn't disappoint because it's an expectation. It's not something based on luck. What about the word Christian? You know, that's a pretty common term that we use, Christian. Now, here's something very unusual about the word Christian if you've never uh, looked at the word and, and, and defined the word before. See, Christian is not actually a word that followers of Christ gave themselves. It was actually those that were opposed to Christians that gave them this term or this word. Now, the word Christian literally means an attachment to Christ or a follower of Christ. Um, some, some definitions would be things like Christ-like or literally little Christ. Uh, but like I said, the idea was this was not a word that Christians gave themselves. It was actually those that were opposed to them that gave them this word. It's sort of, it's kind of a, it was supposed to be sort of a derogatory or a vulgar word that people would say, you know, call them to kind of make fun of them. In fact, we only see this word three times in the Bible, which, which sounds very unique considering this is the main category or word that we would use to to define ourselves as followers of God. We, we would say all over, you know, I am a Christian. Here's a couple of verses. I just put all three since it's only in there three times. In Acts 26, 28, remember Agrippa said, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. In 1 Peter 4, 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory, glorify God in this manner. And then Acts 11.26 is probably the most famous or familiar one. It's the first time. It says, they found him, they brought him to Antioch, and it was for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Christian. So 
I don't think we can say Christian and talk about Christian without talking about disciple because disciple is a word that that is much more familiar to um, the original Greek language in the New Testament of what they would call themselves. They would talk about being a follower of Christ or a disciple of Christ, especially when you're reading the Gospels and you read about those that were literally following Jesus. Uh, you remember in a video two ago, we, we talked about the apostles. You know, they were first disciples and, and Jesus chose from his disciples 12 specific apostles. Well, what is what is actually is a disciple? Is a disciple something that's still around today or is a disciple something just you know, people that follow Jesus when he was alive and now we're, we're Christians, we're not disciples. Well, no, that's not actually the case. We are disciples. Uh, it's a lot of different words we can use to, uh, to talk about ourselves. But the word specifically disciple means a student or a pupil and it means a follower. And it's not just the idea that you're going to school and someone standing before you teaching, it was much more significant than that. And I don't want to go into too much detail in this video, but basically just understand it's the idea of one who follows both the teacher and the teachings. That's what a disciple is. And so we're all continuing to be, you know, students or disciples of Christ because we're still learning. And we're not only following him as a teacher, we're, all, uh, uh, we're also following uh, what he taught that we see in the Word of God. Look at Matthew 28, 19, and 20, probably the most famous passage that uses this word. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, lo, and I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Go and make disciples. Well, what is a disciple? A disciple is a follower. And not necessarily a follower of the men, the apostles he's talking to, but a follower of Jesus Christ. Disciple. And finally, the last word we'll look at this morning is the word worship. Again, you could go into a great detail about this word, just like the word disciple. But for a basic idea, when we say, you know, we come together to worship. Yeah, there are aspects of worship, you know, like singing, like praying like reading the Word of God, you know, giving. Those are aspects of worship. But what actually is worship? Well, if you were to look up the definition of worship, it actually means literally to crouch or to crawl or to bow down. It, it's a reference a lot of times it is used. It's like a, like a, think about like a dog that comes to his master's feet. You know, it's the idea of one who kneels before another person to show respect or to honor someone. And that's exactly what's happening when we worship. Yeah, we have aspects of worshiping God, like singing or praising, but what we're doing is we are honoring His name. We are praising Him. We are worshiping Him. We are humbling ourselves before Him. Think about John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, when it says the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So I would say don't necessarily just focus on worship as far as, okay, have we done our different acts of worship, or we have sang this, we have sang that, we have prayed, but more internally of thinking about yourself, have you honored God, or are you honoring God by respecting, as you come into his presence to worship, are you respecting him? Are you kneeling down before him? Worship. All right, here you go. Here is your test. Uh, you can challenge yourself with other people in the room. Uh, do it ever how you want. Uh, I'm not going to give you the correct answers. Um, you can go back in the video if you really have to find them and watch it over again. Uh, but here's the eight definitions we covered. Here's the words. Here's the definition. See if you can match it up. Feel free to pause the video so it'll stay on your screen. Uh, but again, thank you all for uh, continuing to watch these videos. Hopefully these things are helpful and uh, we will see you again soon.